Hey, 42 here. On September the 6th, 1992, a group of moose hunters came across an old abandoned city bus in the Alaskan wilderness. It was a pretty odd sight considering they were almost 30 miles from the nearest town and nowhere near a road of any kind. But it was also a welcome one. It had been a long day and the bus represented an opportunity to spend the night indoors. If you can actually count a rusting old bus as indoors. Anyway, the moment the hunters stepped over the threshold and entered the vehicle, they were hit by a wall of a foul-smelling air so thick they could practically taste it. This being the Alaskan bush, they first assumed an animal had just crawled into the bus and died. But then, they found a sleeping bag, and inside that, the partially decomposed body of a man. The police arrived on the scene via helicopter the following morning and made haste to investigate this most morbid case. This should have been a tricky one. Half rotten corpses in the middle of nowhere don't give up their secrets easily, or so I'm told. But the officers were in for a pleasant surprise, because beside the body they found a diary and several undeveloped rolls of film. A record of sorts of the man's life. And what an unusual existence it turned out to be. You see, this body didn't belong to a grizzled trapper or a lost hiker, but a 24-year-old idealist who'd given up everything to try and live a simpler, more authentic life. And the story of how he came to die in an old abandoned bus in the middle of nowhere in Alaska is one of the most unusual I've ever told on this channel. It begins with a bigamous marriage and ends with a botanical murder mystery. And it's either soaringly uplifting or utterly idiotic and depressing, depending on who you ask. This is the tale of Christopher McCandless, the man who walked into the wild and never came back. Christopher was born on February the 12th, 1968 in Inglewood, California. His father, Walt, was an aerospace engineer who worked for NASA, and his mother, Billy, helped run the family consultancy business. But don't let this affluent upbringing fool you. Life in the McCandless home was a tale of endless strife. Chris had a younger sister, Corrine, as well as six half-siblings from his father's first marriage. In 2014, Corrine McCandless published a memoir in which she alleged that her parents were verbally and physically abusive both to each other and to their children. After graduating from high school in 1986 with excellent grades, Chris spent the summer on his first major solo adventure. His family had relocated from California to Virginia when he was still a kid, so he travelled back to his home state to spend time with his extended family and a few old friends. But during this detour, he made a disturbing discovery. When he was little, his father had often spent time away from the family home. As a successful businessman, you might think he was simply traveling for work, but no, he was spending time in his other family home. You see, Walt had still been married to his first wife when he met Chris's mother, Billy. Rather than, you know, get a divorce or even break things off, he simply split his time between the families. Even having children with both women at the same time, Chris would later discover that he was just three months older than one of his half-brothers. He was 18 when he found out, and it had a huge impact on him. Some people have even suggested that all the other craziness I'm going to tell you about can be traced back to that one mad revelation. Further education was a chance for Chris to fly his freaky family nest and he excelled at Emory University, graduating in 1980 with double honours in history and anthropology. Most people who knew him in those days expected him to follow a familiar path, start a career, make lots of money, maybe have a family. But Christopher McCandless had no intention of living a conventional life. He saw the expectations of society not as items on a checklist to be ticked off one by one, but has a straitjacket designed to rob us of our freedoms and stifle our creativity. And so, in May 1990, he donated every penny he owned to Oxfam, well over $50,000 in today's money, and without telling a soul where he was going, or even that he was going, he just left. 
He spent that first summer crossing the US in his beaten up yellow Datsun, making it as far as Lake Mead before getting stuck in a flash flood that wrecked the engine and left him stranded. Instead of turning back, Chris forged onwards, hiking, hitchhiking, and riding freight trains. Over a two year spree, traversing the land of the free, Chris built a new life for himself under the assumed name of Alexander Supertramp. It was an alter ego of sorts, a self-made superhero whose only two powers were total freedom and body odor. Nobody knows Christopher's exact whereabouts during that time on the road, and what we do know mostly comes from the memories of people whose paths he crossed along the way. He spent a few months working as a grain operator for a man he met whilst hitchhiking in South Dakota. He lived on the streets of Las Vegas, learnt lever working from a retired Vietnam vet who grew so attached to Chris, he offered to adopt him as a grandson. He lived in hermit camps and off-grid communities, hiked through some of the most spectacular national parks on planet Earth, and illegally kayaked down the Colorado River all the way to Mexico. In short, he roamed where he pleased, answered to nobody, and completely cut himself off from the usual worries and expectations of the rest of the world. He had no bills to pay, no boss to suck up to, and no requirements beyond putting food in his belly and finding a place to rest his head. He left home in search of freedom, and boy, that's exactly what he'd found. As exhilarating as that must have been, it wasn't enough. It was true that Chris was no longer living by society's rules, but he was still living in society, or at least surrounded by it. And so, in early 1992, he ceased his carefree wherever the wind takes me wandering and began pathing his way purposefully north. His goal was the United States' last great wilderness, a state that's comfortably bigger than France, Spain and Germany put together but with less than half a percent of their combined population. Alaska. It was to be the site of Alexander Supertramp's greatest and final adventure. On the 28th of April, a Fairbanks electrician called Jim Gallion gave Christopher a lift to the head of the Stampede Trail. Most Alaskans know a thing or two about surviving in the wilderness, and Jim was immediately concerned that Chris didn't exactly seem to be prepared for a long spell out in the bush. He had little in the way of provisions, his rifle lacked the power to easily take down Alaska's bigger game or its more dangerous wildlife, and his hiking boots weren't even waterproof. He carried no compass, no snowshoes, and very few tools. He didn't even have a map. In short, Chris appeared to have none of the gear and no idea. Jim Gallion was right to be concerned because he would be the last person to see Christopher McCandless alive. Chris's original plan had been to hike clear across Alaska until he hit the Bering Sea. But just four days and 30 odd miles into his journey, having forded two rivers and skidded across several frozen beaver ponds, he stumbled upon an abandoned bus that was soon to become his home, and eventually his tomb. You won't be surprised to hear that life in the Alaskan bush was pretty tough. The weather was changeable and often extreme, and food was difficult to come by. But despite the hardships, Chris was living his dream of existing entirely free of the influence of the outside world. For food, he foraged for berries, dug up roots, and shot squirrels, ptarmigan, porcupines, and even a moose. Though he was unable to preserve this mighty mammal, so most of the meat spoiled. He survived encounters with bears and wolves, watched herds of caribou cross the tiger, and spent his downtime reading classics by Henry David Thoreau, Leo Tolstoy, and Nikolai Gogol. Chris was clearly a resourceful guy, his two years on the road had proven that, but it seems he'd underestimated just how hard it would be to live entirely off-grid in Alaska. And whilst his diary shows he was able to gather a steady stream of food, he simply couldn't get his hands on enough calories to fuel his body through the challenging Alaskan days. Despite his best efforts, slowly but surely, Christopher McCandless was beginning to weaken. Pictures from the undeveloped rolls of film found with his body would later reveal how thin almost skeletal he became. 
He must have recognized the danger he was in because on day 67 of his Alaskan odyssey, he decided enough was enough. He packed up his meager belongings, said goodbye to his bus-based abode, and began hiking back up the Stampede Trail. An incredibly frail Alexander Supertramp had decided it was time to return to civilization. Two days later, he reached the Teklanika River, and what he saw made his spine shiver. When he'd crossed this very stream from the other side at the start of his journey, it was knee-deep and placid. Now, swollen by two months of summer meltwater, it had morphed into a raging torrent of freezing, frothing death. Chris wasn't the strongest of swimmers at the best of times, but right now, that didn't matter one dime. The love child of Michael Phelps and Flipper the Dolphin couldn't have crossed that river and lived to tell the tale. With little of a choice, Chris simply turned around and headed back to the bus. It's hard to imagine just how scared he must have been as it hit home that he'd become trapped in this wilderness. But some time after he got back to the bus, we have no way of knowing exactly when, he wrote a brief note and posted it to the door of his makeshift home. It read, Attention possible visitors, SOS, I need your help. I am injured, near death and too weak to hike out. I am all alone. This is no joke. In the name of God, please remain to save me. I am out collecting berries close by and shall return this evening. Thank you, Chris McCandless. August, question mark. By the time someone finally read those words, Christopher McCandless had been dead for almost three weeks. In the days and weeks after Chris's return to the bus, his condition continued to deteriorate, his body growing weaker as he slowly starved to death. His diary entries during that period make for some pretty tough reading. Day 94, extremely weak, fault of pot, seed, much trouble just to stand up, starving, great jeopardy. Day 100, made it, but in weakest condition of life. Death looms as serious threat, too weak to walk out, have literally become trapped in the wild. No game. Nobody knows exactly what Christopher was going through in those final few days of his life, but there's no doubt, he knew he was going to die. And yet, despite the hunger, despite the hardship, despite the loneliness, he still somehow managed to marvel at the beauty that was all around him. In those final dying days, he took one final self-portrait. In it, he's smiling a beaming smile and waving at the camera, and in his hand he holds a handwritten note that reads, I have had a happy life, and thank the Lord. Goodbye, and my God bless all. If one of the objectives of Christopher's trip was to find peace, with this picture, I hope we can say that he truly, finally found it. On day 107, the final words in his diary simply read, Beautiful blue berries. Six days later, on day 113, the entries run out. So far as we know, that was the day Christopher McCandless died. His autopsy would later show that he weighed just 30 kilograms when he passed away, and his cause of death was ruled to be starvation. That might sound fairly obvious given the circumstances, but interestingly enough, that verdict has actually been a little controversial in the decades since. You see, many people believe that Chris died not because he didn't have enough to eat, but because he accidentally ingested some kind of poison that left him too weak to gather enough food. John Krakauer, author of Into the Wild, the book that first brought Christopher's story to the masses, has spent the last few decades attempting to prove that the seeds of the wild potato plant, apparently referenced on day 94 of Chris's diary, are not, as botanists have long believed, harmless, but are in fact poisonous under the right circumstances. He's thrown plenty of theories around over the years, and most have been disproved. But in 2015, he published a study that claims to have found elevated levels of the anti-metabolite L-canavanine in sample seeds gathered from the site of the bus. The study ultimately concluded that consumption of these seeds very likely contributed to Christopher's death. Anyway, poison aside, 
if you've read Into the Wild or seen the film adaptation, there's a good chance you think of Christopher McCandless as an idealist who should be admired for his courage and principles. But not everybody views him that way. In fact, there are plenty of people who see Chris as an arrogant idiot who got himself killed thanks to a woeful lack of understanding of what he was getting himself into. As uncharitable as that hot take may seem, there's no denying that Chris was somewhat unprepared for his final adventure. I've already mentioned that he tried to hike back to civilization two months into his trip before being thwarted by the swollen Tetlankia River. What I didn't mention is that just 800 meters downstream from his attempted crossing point was a hand-operated cable car that would have allowed him to cross the river with ease. If he'd a map with him, he'd have known that, and he would quite possibly still be alive today. Ultimately, there's probably a kernel of truth in both viewpoints, but whatever your feelings towards the man who called himself Alexander Supertramp, it's hard not to admire his single-minded determination to live the life he wanted to live. Most of us follow the pathways laid out before us by society and the expectations of our families and friends without ever really questioning it. And we all know plenty of people who diligently work away at careers they don't particularly like so they can afford to buy things they neither want nor need. Christopher McCandless saw our obsession with money, status, success, and material things, and just rejected it. He didn't want a career. He wanted a life. And he didn't need things. He craved experiences. It's funny to think that Chris walked into the wild in what many of us would have considered to have been a simpler time, a time before the internet had wormed its way into every corner of our lives, and before we carried smartphones in our pockets. So you could say his message is more relevant today than it's ever been before. And that's probably why his story continues to speak to people, even today, years after his death. Thanks for watching.